anniversary is on the 10th of July, and we are celebrating it today. We are celebrating it today because the 10th of July fell on on a Saturday, on a Sunday this year. To the president, president elect, ESCO, REPCO, past presidents, national librarian, LIASA members, librarians at large, good morning. Welcome to the 2020, 2022 LIASA anniversary. In, 2020, in 2014, the 10th of July was declared as a special day dedicated to celebrate librarians. This day is meant to instill the love of librarianship as a worth, worthwhile professional career. We want to change the stereotype perception that people have about librarians. We all know that people perceive librarians before, not now, as people who wear bands, spectacles, stem books, shushing the kids at the counter and making sure that everybody has a book that they go home with. We want to raise our awareness about different types of librarianship that you can have from the information managers, knowledge managers, e-resources, librarians, research librarians, information specialist librarians, youth librarians, etc. We want to promote and advocate for our profession. What is nice this year is that this day is not only, we're not only celebrating our profession, but we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of LIASA. Our past president would say halala, which would be the right way of saying it now, and say, we may we continue and strengthen our profession. I'm going to ask everybody to mute their mics all the time um, unless they are presenting. And I'm also going to ask people to mute their videos uh, to make sure that we, we can all hear each other and welcome the president with his message. Thank you, Nazim. Thank you very much, Linda. Ntaka, our national PRO, um, for that warm welcome to this event. Good morning, colleagues, um, to the EXCO members, the representative council members, national librarian, um, the ASK members, um, and librarians. Uh, welcome to this event celebrating South African Librarians Day. And over and above that, the 25th anniversary of the ASA as an association. What a milestone. It gives me great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm very heartened by the amount of people that are online considering the load shedding that we are dealing with. Um, yes, today, or well, actually yesterday, um, but in this event today, we're celebrating many things. Um, South African Librarians Day, the 25th anniversary of Riasa, but there are other things that have also happened within this space of time. Um, it's been 20 years since we celebrated um, South African Library Week. It's also 20 years um, that we, and now my thoughts have left me. Um, it's also been um, 20 years since we, um, as I said, celebrated South African Library Week for the very first time. And it's also been a milestone in terms of the South African Journal of Libraries and Information Science Sagittarius, um, because 10 years ago, uh, LIASA basically um, took over, or actually 20 years ago, um, took over the journal as we know it now um, and had the name change so quite a lot of milestones that we have celebrated. Um, as you would have seen from the amazing videos that our national PRO did for the celebration leading up to today, there are many milestones that we have celebrated over this period of time. And 
yes, there are many things that we still have to do and we still have to achieve and we're still fighting for after all of this time. But I think today we want to revel in what we have done up to this point, um, what we have celebrated up to this point. And we shouldn't lose sight of all the amazing achievements that Liasa has managed to achieve over this period of time. In terms of library associations, we still an infant um, to many degrees. Um, we are 25 years old, but compared to some other library associations, we still have a long way to go. So in this welcoming message, I just want to say that let's look forward to the next 25 years and beyond. And for this short period that we're with each other today, let's celebrate and look back on what we have achieved thus far. I hope that you're going to enjoy the program with us. And I hope that the people that we have lined up to speak to you today will inspire you to look forward to the next 25 years, to celebrate the fact that we are librarians, one of the most amazing professions to be in. Um, it is an amazing job that while many people say still to this day, oh, but don't you just stamp books? I think in the last two, three years, that we've been dealing with COVID, I think we've really shown what we are capable of, how we are adapting, how we have always adapted. Um, I think librarians are some of the most resilient people in the world. We have managed to adapt time and time again, and we'll continue to adapt. Um, even in this day, our doom was written many years ago when the internet came about, when Google came about, and yet here we are. Um, there's a cartoon that does the rounds or a meme that does the rounds on the internet um, about a book sitting next to a broom. Um, I, I think it is. And, and basically saying, well, you know, they created the vacuum cleaner, but here I am. Um, and I think libraries are like that. Um, libraries have learned to evolve, have learned to adapt and will continue to do so. The nature of what we do might change. Um, but libraries remain a constant in people's lives. And if I look at what's happening across the world, if I look at what is happening in South Africa in relation to libraries, I think it still gives me hope that people see the value of a library, that people see the value of visiting a library. Um, and I think as long as information is around, librarians will be relevant and continue to be relevant. And on that note, a happy South African Librarians Day, and I hope that you're going to enjoy this event. Um, over to you, Ms. Program Director. Thank you. Thank you, Nazim, for a wonderful welcome. Um, we, 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 we cannot run away from the fact that uh, a lot has happened. There was COVID, the technological changes, the challenges that we have, but what we like, and like you said, is the fact that people still value li libraries and therefore value librarians. While we were thinking about this program, we thought, let us talk about the future because um, now we have done 25 years, we have achieved a lot of things that Nazim, some of them has mentioned, but what is gonna happen in the future? Professor Ina Fori, who's a full professor and head of department of information science and chair of the School of Information Technology in the University of Pretoria, will be taking us through the journey on the perception on what is gonna happen in future in the LIS schools. She holds positions in the leadership, in the leadership of the ASIS and T executive board and ISIC, steering committee. Her research focuses on information behavior, especially health information, behavior in cancer, palliative care, grief and bereavement, information literacy, and more recently, participatory, a participant in the third space in information sharing. She has collaborated with researchers in Israel, UK, USA, Sweden, 
and the Netherlands, and she has been a visiting academic to the US and New Zealand. Over to you, Professor Foray. Thank you so much for the introduction and Anne-Marie can actually move on to my next slide. I want to say when I received the invitation, I was very honored and I was very excited to think about this. And the more I started thinking, the more I got anxious and I'm not normally anxious because I, as you've heard, present very often. But the bottom line is, I cannot tell you what the future will be. I cannot tell you what the future, how the departments of library and information science in this country is going to see the future. What I can do is to put some ideas on the table. And I'm very mindful of the fact that I am getting 10 minutes to do this. So first of all, I want to start by saying this is my personal viewpoint. The University of Pretoria's Department of Information Science is we're passionate about libraries and research in libraries. And we do that on master's and doctoral level, where myself and my colleagues are able to do that. But for a number of years, we haven't been offering the traditionally associated library science subjects in our undergraduate and honors field. It just turned out that that was not possible, but there are other institutions in the country that's focused more strongly on that, but I want to emphasize that we are passionate about libraries. And, and when you think about the future, there are many things that you can do. You can do scenario building, you can do a Delphi study, and these things are very important, but it's time consuming. And the way that things are changing nowadays, I think it's almost, the changes are happening so quickly. I don't want to say that these are not relevant, but one has to use such techniques with care. And that is not what I can bring to the table today. But I want to say the things that I can share with you, the things that I can say with absolute confidence. The future of library and information science education in South Africa, and also the libraries and information institutions, would very much depend on our mindset, our confidence, our attitude. I completed my four-year bachelor's degree in library and information science in 1981. I then continued with the honors degree in information science, library and information science, and then further on. And not once in my life have I been ashamed to say I am trained as a librarian and I hold a four-year degree in library and information science. That is how I frequently introduce myself when I talk at oncology conferences and elsewhere. And I think that is what we need to do. We need to be proud. We need to own what we achieve and what we studied for. I have a bullet here, is there a future? I know we ask this question very frequently, but to be honest, since I've completed my first degree, I have never doubted that there will be a future. Maybe I'm naive, but I'm absolutely confident that there will be a future, maybe a different future that we will define. And defining that future is what our departments of library and information science should prepare our students to do. The other thing that I really want to stress looking towards the future is that a degree is just a starting point. No institution in this country or elsewhere in the world can prepare you for everything that you will face. But having some tools and certain abilities is what will put people in the position to deal with the future and the rapid changes. So when we make our choices in terms of our curricula, we literally make choices in terms of our abilities, what we think is important, but at least for myself, I fully acknowledge that this is only a small part of what can be taught in the dress. Moving forward, generic skills, the abilities to read, and I'll say more about this a little bit later, looking at holistic things, bigger issues and critical skills is what's going to be important and that should become part of our curricula. If I can't talk to other institutions in the country, I can just say that at the University of Pretoria, we are really increasingly held accountable for how we teach, how we develop curricula, 
is no longer just your research that carries you forward. If you apply for promotion as an educator, you need to show evidence of your teaching practices, your teaching philosophies as well. The one thing that I can also say with absolute certainty is the emphasis on quality. It is no longer just doing things okay -ish. I see there's a hand up. Um, I'm, I'm going to continue. Um, the quality is very important in terms of all our work because of the global world that we are living in. We can access people internationally and they can see what we are doing. And overall, if I look at the quality of journal articles, at quality of conference papers, and the expectations that are required when you apply for a job, there is a tremendous increase in South Africa and internationally. And again, that is what we should prepare our students for. How to look elsewhere, how to see, compare what you are doing, how you are doing it. We should focus on content and skills that continue to be important. It seems as if I've been talking to myself. Can somebody just confirm if you can hear me? We can yes, hear we can you. Yes, okay, because there's some audible. people that, okay, there's some people that said um, they can't hear me, so I'm sorry about that. I can hear I, you. I, okay, I came in beforehand to test. Okay, so content and skills that continue to be important. If we look at the things that we've been traditionally teaching in library and information finds, things like information searching, that is still our, one of our most important skills that we can bring to the table. And it's not going to go away ever, I think. It might change in how you do it and the requirements to be very good at this might be increasing, but it's always going to be there. And there are many other skills. And um, the one thing that I, I often subscribe my ability to do research and, and to do a lot to the fact that I am, I'm not too bad at searching for information. That is what I started doing when I entered workplace. And that is what I've been teaching for many, many years. So at any department, look at the core things that you think will be going on and what we can bring to the table. Other things that are important now for a long time, and that is going to be increasingly important, is the ability to understand teaching principles. Who are going to teach the people who are new to information literacy, digital literacy? Who are going to help us to bridge the gray digital divide? People like myself who are competent in one thing, but we need to learn to do other things in terms of rapidly increasing technological developments. So I can go to the next slide. A few ideas of things that I think is going to be important and that should be included in our curricula. Environmental scanning and competitive intelligence. And you can use other terms for that. That is not exactly the same, but might be more familiar is current awareness services, alerting services. And not just on an individual basis to see what your competitors are doing, but as a profession in a country and also internationally, what is happening so that we can respond in time and invent our future. Not just getting literature and reading and talking, but to be critical to get the essence out of that and to make decisions based on interpretation. Another thing that is getting more important, and I'm picking that up in the international literature, is the ability to create. And not just to save and organize and make available. As an academic, I need to stress the importance of theories. In our education, we are introduced to some theory, but I think much more should be done there. Because a good theory can give you in a few words the essence of why something is happening. And that is what you can deal with. It is also internationally getting more important if our students, our academics want to publish, to have a, a more acute sense of the theories of the field. Um, 
critical race theories, critical library theories, information poverty theories, and there are so many. We cannot address all, but we can make our students and our future practitioners aware of the importance. And you are not prescribed by theory, but theory can make it easier to understand the essence of what is happening. The one thing that I think with our DAB is going to be very important is open access, data management, data repositories, and so forth. And I'm not going to say a lot about that, but I'm confident that this is going to be the road ahead for quite a number of years, if not forever. We've always seen information as a thing, our books, our articles, but there are also processes in, in place. And our training should open our students to to facilitate such processes as information sharing, as getting together and soliciting information from users and other people, but also sharing to increase our knowledge base. And then you get to fields like knowledge management and so forth. I'm not going to say anything about that. Two other fields that are very important for now and for definitely for a number of years to come is information ethics. And this is where librarians and information specialists can make a big difference in terms of raising awareness. And there are many things that can be included in that. Our department has been hosting the African Center of Excellence for Information Ethics now since 2012. Um, and a lot of work is done there, but there is much more to do. And then also dipping into artificial intelligence and to see what we can do from the library information science point of view. And obviously the last bullet might not surprise you because this is my field of speciality, but that is not the only reason why I include information behavior and information practice. This is very core to what we are doing in library and information science. Information behavior includes seeking, searching, encountering, sharing, disseminating, using, just one example um, of the benefit that these can have for the bigger society. I'm currently working on a research project with the Department of Civil Engineering on informal transportation, where we're going to collect information on needs, circumstances and so forth. And where people with the right expertise can, can transfer this into um, information and, and using technology to make it easier for people to find information, people who can also access um, government policies and so forth. And for me, this is a project that has been more important to my core field of interest than anything that I've done before in cancer, call, um, palliative care and so forth. We can move to the next slide, please, okay. Our students should learn how to do research on a small scale so that they can go into practice and do that to get involved in especially action research. Where you do research, you implement it, you check and you develop it again and again and again. And also in the methods for participative design and research. That is for me the way for the future and something that should be core to what we introduce our students to. And then also to to ethnographic research, which is very, very different, where people look into their own experiences. Librarians can do this, information specialists can do it, but more importantly, to teach our students to read and to analyze what has been reported in autoethnographic research output books, articles. Because this is research that can inform us of the hardships and the challenges of society and where a difference might be needed. So moving forward, our students need to be very competent in technological developments, but also to deal with the deep human emotions and challenges that people are experiencing. Reading, I should have put that in capital letters. We should learn to read books. Books, 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 not just journal articles, not just quick bits and pieces, but to go back to the original ideas. And our pro profession is perfect for that. Another thing growing, moving forward, cultural competency, 
raising awareness for that and how to address it. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I just want to raise two more things. I think to learn our students, to introduce them to communities of practice and collaborative work, because nobody on their own is strong enough to function appropriately in the future. There's too many challenges. We need to work together. We need to learn to facilitate those spaces between ourselves where we might have different opinions and ideas. The other thing that I want to stress is introducing our students to professional organizations and involvement locally, such as Lehasa, but also internationally. Not because international is better, but because international can add a bigger world and ideas and people with skills and competencies and free opportunities such as webinars to gain more knowledge. To see the value of that and that to bring the value of local and international back to your own community and to share. And these are the only things that I can add for today. There are many, many more, but as I say, time is limited and this is what I want to put on the table. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Ferry, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I like the fact that you have reminded us to go back to the roots and the roots will guide us to the future. The fact that we still need to read books and read books, not only the general articles. So that, that is so wonderful because um, what we've learned as the core roots of our profession will work. You mentioned things like the concept will change, um, uh, things will change, or the, we will change the how we do things, but the concepts don't change. So the basics that we had taught at library schools will always work. And then as we add experience in the things that we do, things they change on how we do things. So thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We hope that LIS schools will be taking everything that we're doing uh, in our libraries and incorporating their LA schools for a better um, education in future. Thank you so much. Um, we are now going to move on with our program and ask um, Ms. Kim to give us a poem about library adventure. Over to you, Ms. Kim. Library Adventure. As soon as you enter the library and greet the friendly librarian behind the circulation desk, your quest for information and adventure begins. The friendly librarian provides you with the information to begin your quest and you venture, and you venture to the treasure that you seek amongst the million other resources sitting on the shelf. Once you open the book, the item, and read or listen to it. You get sucked into a world, a new world. You are either transported back in time or in a weird and wonderful land or running away from things that go bump in the night. Or trying a new dish Mm. or de-stressing technique, fighting dragons, flying a rocket ship, so solving a, a murder, or dancing to the music. or laughing your pants off. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Once you close the item and return to reality, but you decide to use your magic card to take the stage home with you, the 
the friendly librarian tells you another secret. That the library will be having more of the activities for you to join, such as skills workshops, reading programs, book clubs, and all sorts of leisure programs for you and your family, your whole family to join. You are amazed. You say, sign me up. I never knew the library had so much things to do. You look at the library with new eyes. You no longer see a building, but you see a big portal that can, that can take you anywhere. A search engine, where you can find all the information that you need. A community hub, where you can experience and learn new things. You leave the library with a sense of hope and with a thought that with librarians and libraries, anything is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, for a wonderful poem. Yes, indeed, libraries are a portal of everything, not only the buildings. Um, we're going to continue with our program um, and hear uh, what public libraries perspective um, on future of librarianship is, uh, is in South Africa. The presentation will be done by Ms. Nobuntum Pendulo, who is the director at the city of Johannesburg Libraries. Over to you, Ms. Nobuntum. Um, my apologies, uh, Ms. Linda, I, I thought maybe um, the message uh, reached you, but our director could not um, make it because she lost her voice, so she, she will join, but she won't be able to, to speak uh, in doing the presentation, so I will do the presentation on her behalf. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, okay, you can continue, so yes. Okay, I will share my screen just now. Okay, just one second. Share screen. Okay, can we all see my screen? You can just confirm. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. On behalf of our director, Ms. Nobudumbendulo, thank you so much to the LIASA leadership and to all the LIASA members who've joined and everyone else who's affiliated. So I will just go through the presentation as she would have loved to present it. Unfortunately, uh, she doesn't have her voice, but I will be the voice for now. And if there are questions, you can uh, pass them through the chat. So uh, who is City of Johannesburg Library Information Services? We have a network of dynamic public libraries that are places of choice for communities. And we are aligned to the City of Johannesburg Smart City Strategy and the 2040 Growth and Development Strategy, focusing on increased literacy skills and lifelong learning for all citizens. So uh, library and information services promote lifelong learning, literature, literature, literacy, reading development, and social cohesion through free and guided access to information, focusing on early childhood development, educational support, information literacy, and digital literacy for all. And this is what's going to be a huge part of the presentation, digital literacy. We also support the Houghton Library and Information Services vision of creating libraries of the future. So these are the challenges our director uh, uh, would have loved to pose uh, to us as the, the, the LIS members. Um, among other challenges, these are the two areas that she would have loved to focus on. Visibility of public libraries. So these are the questions that um, one should ask. Are we doing enough to place libraries at the center of the current global village? Meaning um, as, as things are happening all over the world, um, where are libraries uh, placed? 
Are we creating environments within our spaces to embrace transformation? Transformation in, in any, in, of any sorts, not just digital transformation. Uh, do we see, uh, are we seen as agents of transformation? How are we engaging with our communities to create awareness? Are we talking enough about our work that positively affect communities? Because a lot of libraries, even from small municipalities, do a lot uh, of, of really great uh, programs and activities, but uh, we don't talk about our work that much. Are we using digital platforms and other networks to, end, to, to place libraries in the minds of communities? And of course, the big one is, do we have enough budget allocation in terms of funds for awareness and marketing in public libraries? Some libraries do have some type of funding, but generally that's the, the main issue that most public libraries uh, would say is a challenge to say, do we have money to, to really market our libraries? And this last point is to say, are we spoken about in spaces outside LIS or education and arts, which other professions take our work and contribution seriously? Um, like other departments, if they were, if they, if they talk about the value of libraries to support their work, that needs to, that is a challenge that you need to look at. And then digital literacy for staff and com communities, how far are we? Do we want to just buy uh, budgets for, for, for libraries, but having communities who are not skilled in using those, those gadgets. So we need to support the development of digital skills for, for communities and staff. So these are the two challenges you identified uh, as uh, some of the, the areas we need to look at in public libraries in future. Okay, so from uh, the City of Johannesburg vision, we will be extracting from our digital transformation strategy. Um, the public libraries should be intentional in embracing technology, not just because everyone is doing it, but because it's, necessary, it's a necessary change to improve services and to stay relevant. And, and the next part, which we've already embarked on the city of Johannesburg, is change management. It's a necessity for staff to embrace new ideas, innovation, and to become better librarians. Uh, for us in the city of Johannesburg, we've already started uh, change management training for senior staff, and we also uh, it will cascade down to the, the junior staff as well. So they, they they need to understand the need for innovation. Okay, so in the city of Johannesburg, um, as I've mentioned, digital transformation is a, is a big concept for us, like in most industries as well, and we define it as integrating digital technologies in all areas of library work, resulting in fundamental change in how libraries operate and bring value to communities, thereby increasing efficiency and productivity. So, so the underlined uh, words are, are key to why do we want to uh, go through a digital transformation in libraries. Um, obviously, these four are, are, are areas that all public libraries can relate to. How do we uh, improve employability for youth? How do we support entrepreneurship? How do we bridge the digital divide? And how do we enable citizens to gain access to the knowledge economy and the digital economy where most transactions are online, people are communicating using technology, especially post COVID, where COVID forced people to learn online, to do things online, et cetera. But uh, most importantly as well, it's about repositioning library services. And it's, this is applicable to all public libraries, uh, my direct ability. Okay, so these are the ingredients that uh, she would have liked to emphasize on to say, if we transform public libraries, uh, we need a dynamic and adaptive leadership and workforce who's ready and open to change. We need willingness to integrate digital, digital technologies, and we need agile uh, LIS operations so that we are able to, we are open to be moved to different directions in public so, uh, the, so uh, in my next slide, I'm just going to focus on the three areas that are from our transformation strategy, uh, which is staff skills, library spaces, and library services. Okay, so as part of transforming libraries, upskilling and reskilling staff where we learn, we unlearn, and we relearn things. This is the question that 
we, that my director believes everyone should be asking, what is my value as a EIB staff with my current skill set and or qualification? Am I still excited by library work? Can I contribute in this digital technology? Do I embrace technology? These are the, 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 the questions that, um, this is a question for all librarians to ask themselves. So upskilling is about introducing new skills to the, to the employees in the same workspace. So library, libraries need to train, we need to train librarians on new skills that are necessary to transform librarianship um, in, 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 in the same space. Reskilling uh, uh, is about introducing employees to new workspaces or new environments where they can, they can learn new skills. So public li library leaders need to be willing to move staff around and provide them with different skills for different units or services. We've, we've uh, already started this in City of Johannesburg, just with the interns, to have interns, the majority of them library science interns, but others are from other fields. And they introduced our libraries to different uh, concepts and different theories that they've learned in, in, their other, in their fields of studies. The next one is transforming library services. The question that a user will ask, why should I go into that building when I have a phone, a computer, and a Wi-Fi or internet? So this is the question that in future public libraries should always, uh, that the users might be asking themselves in terms of the value of libraries as, as buildings that are there in their community. Future public libraries will have to be redesigned and repurposed as library spaces that are community centers. So, centered. so these are the areas that uh, a library space should be reimagined to, to, to address. Working from home, for example, having cubicles in libraries with Wi-Fi, support learning from home, for example, online courses that we've already started introducing, supporting e-business startup, for example, people who want to start businesses must be able to come to the library and, and be assisted in, uh, in starting a business without having to go to, to other spaces where they have to pay for. Um, even though we, 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 with librarians knowing their limitations as well, but just creating a space where people can be able to, to access. Hi, Jeff. And then, transformed and interactive library services. Another question that a user might be asking in terms of library services, why should I use a library material when, when we have internet-based content and services like YouTube, etc.? So again, looking at public access and circulation of materials, Libraries should invest in, in, in uh, modern technology, whether it's artificial intelligence based uh, or robotics or using apps and websites. Um, Aina, Aina has already mentioned um, the use of data science. Um, community outreach is where libraries should provide services that are based on research needs. We need to be informed by the public and the current atmosphere where we are competing with virus platforms. What makes our services stand out and change that? Doing a survey once a year is not enough to make uh, decisions on services to provide, but we need to make use of data science to determine what services some of us can provide. Technology can really empower us on a regular basis to say what information is available to make certain decisions about funding, about buying books, et cetera, for the services that we provide. So, this is where uh, we can transform our library services. Uh, sorry, my slide just went quickly. So, um, so these are the, the four areas of transformation that I would believe public libraries can also focus on the user experience, the employee performance, as I've already mentioned, the skill set, competitive advantage. How do we look at these uh, platforms and see? if we can embrace them rather than compete against them. And then using data science to play and analyze, collect information, integrate things, is, is gonna be a very important uh, element in, in improving 
uh, library services in public libraries. Okay, and then this is just a, a pictorial view of some of the services that are already available in other international libraries. And it's really dependent on availability of funds and, uh, and other variables. So, so it's just an, a, a visual image of how we would love to see public libraries in the future. Uh, as you can see there, these are some of, some of these are computer rooms that are already, that are already available, touch screens. We, we are working on introducing a maker space in some of our libraries. Um, these are touch screens again using artificial intelligence in, in, in entrances. Uh, self check in and out of book kiosk, the robot library assistant. I think we've seen this in Invest of Pretoria, but what about public libraries? Uh, electronics shelf catalog, um, other international libraries have this in public libraries. And gaming spaces, uh, the Houghton province has, has donated some gaming devices in some of our libraries. We hope could be more in other as well if we can afford it and um, yes i will answer any other questions but that's the end of my direct presentation i thank you so much for the opportunity on behalf of the director and our service members thank you so much jeff um for a wonderful presentation um, you mentioned quite a lot of things, and I think each and every public librarian who is on this platform now would love to have um, a budget um, that would um, give us a future library that we would want to have. And this is a challenge that we all have um, in public libraries. There are certain things that you have mentioned that the city of Joburg is currently doing. And I want to challenge everybody who's here, who works at the Metropolitan City, to look at using the academy, the Liasa Academy, in sharing these resources. Because if you look at what you're doing and what other libraries in the, in the far outside of South Africa, it's totally different. And therefore, we can use that academy to skill, to upskill, and to learn and unlearn certain things that we're doing to bridge that divide. So if everybody can just avail themselves so that we can have a future and everybody, if the future that is the same to all libraries and everybody can be at par. Thank you so much, Jeff, for a wonderful presentation. Thank Our you. next speaker, who is Dr. Matthew Moyo. Dr. Matthew Moyo is currently the chief director library and information services at the Northwest University of South Africa. His experience in the LIS field is, spans more than 25 years. He is also a lecturer um, in the information science field for more than five years. He holds a doctor's degree in library and information science, as well as leadership qualifications. Matthew's research are in the areas of information literacy, research data man management, user behavior, governance management, amongst others. He's so passionate about mentorship and capacity, capacity building. Dr. Matthew Moyo, take us to the future of librarianship in South Africa in a higher education library perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Linda, and uh, good morning to colleagues. Uh, my presentation, as you have already indicated, focuses on the future of librarianship in South Africa from a higher education library perspective. I'm glad that I'm, I'm presenting at this point after Prof. Ina has spoken in terms of uh, pedagogy and, and, and research at our higher education uh, institutions. And I'm also excited that uh, Jeff has also uh, presented on um, the, uh, the public library perspective, um, which, which makes it a lot easier also to approach this uh, question from an academic library perspective. Mm. 
I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Right, uh, there we go. This is my outline. I had, I did a bit of some scoping in terms of um, where we're coming from as uh, uh, higher education libraries or academic libraries and where we are now. And I also looked a bit at uh, drivers of change and I had to do a bit of some projections into the future. I also looked at uh, uh, challenges and opportunities that uh, the current uh, state presents us. And of course, I had a final thought. Right, so as indicated already, I tracked a bit of some developments in um, academic libraries from the past to where we are now. And uh, as we all know, we coming from a single mode uh, library by way of the physical library to a hybrid uh, modality, whereby we are running two sets of libraries, the physical library and the online library. We are also coming from a cut catalog environment to an online catalog as well as cataloging environment. And we are further coming from a print journals to an e-journals environment. Uh, related to that, we are also coming from a print uh, books to an e-books environment. A print intensive to space intensive libraries. We are further coming from a more library centric uh, we all know that uh, we used to say these are our, our books um, and we are now coming to an era where we have to focus more on the users. We are also coming from an inward looking library structure to a more outward looking structure in terms of what the core business of the institution is. We are also coming from my point of view from the heart of the campus as libraries to the engine of the core business of the institution. And we are also coming from a sole supplier of scholarly information to a collaborator. We are coming from an era where we used to have computer labs and now we have moved to research or teaching commons, teaching and learning commons, uh, maker spaces, we are also coming from an era where we had very few qualified librarians to more qualified staff. We are further coming from an era that uh, the program uh, director referred to also as uh, the shushing environment. So this is from a no noise in the library environment to a hybrid uh, species. Uh, including coffee shops and cafes where you can have users uh, speaking to one another. We are further coming from a single user space in terms of uh, the teaching and learning approaches to collaborative uh, spaces within our libraries. What are the trends in the academic library uh, world? Uh, these are some of uh, the recent trends, change management, new skills for new leadership to manage change in a volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity world, and the need to get it right. Evolving integrated library systems, the emergence of majors and cloud-based and open source library systems, uh, learning analytics, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, open access as both Prof. Uh, Ina and Jeff also alluded to, uh, the aspect of um, research data services that is quite a growing area within the academic library service environment. Then of course the need for social justice as it relates to open science, uh, stream, streaming media, 
uh, students' uh, well-being. Uh, that is the provision of well-being spaces uh, within our libraries. So in terms of uh, the drivers of change, I, I looked at uh, technology and in particular the fourth industrial uh, revolution. We have witnessed an increase in electronic information resources. We have also seen growth in the technological solutions, self-check machines, RFID, 3 printing, makerspaces, uh, mobile apps. We have also seen the coming in of robots in our libraries. Jeff referred to uh, the University of Pretoria. Recently, we also saw one uh, in our library of South Africa, and as Northwest University, I can also share that uh, we are currently uh, in the workshop developing a robot also for the institution. Then I looked at uh, trends in the core business of the institution, uh, just in the university setup, or it could be a college setup. And I looked at teaching and learning as well as research in innovation and community uh, engagement. So in terms of um, uh, teaching and learning, I looked at digital assessment that is also growing in vigilation apps, use of uh, open educational resources, MOOCs, and uh, the influence of uh, the gig economy. I also looked at uh, the visual teaching and learning, which is quite growing, um, uh, partly as a result of uh, the pandemic that we, we, we currently have in terms of COVID-19. Growth in distance e-learning, self-directed learning, student wellness and success. Then in terms of research, I looked at um, uh, open science, open access, uh, research data management, uh, and the skills that are required, uh, data literacy and social justice. I also looked at uh, collaboration, internationalization, uh, decolonia decolonization, INDA and multidisciplinary research, the fourth industrial uh, revolution and COVID-19 response research. So these are, in my view, uh, some of the ongoing trends in our core business, and they have a direct on how we plan our services. Then the academic library is going into the future. I looked at, uh, I think, about three issues uh, in terms of our spaces, redesigning and repurposing of spaces. Uh, uh, in some cases, we have witnessed uh, academic libraries introducing student lounges, uh, teaching and learning commons, maker spaces, uh, digital scholarship centers, and the aspect of digitization, 3D printers, virtual reality centers, and research commons. And in terms of people, and in particular skills that are expected and, and required, uh, going into the future, we I looked at uh, new areas of um, uh, support like open science, access, research data management, data literacy, analytics, publishing libraries or library as a publisher, scholarly communication. Then there's also the aspect of digital skills that are required, multidisciplinary uh, uh, skills from diverse fields. And I think I need to emphasize this from diverse fields so that we can be better able to support uh, diverse needs of our um, user communities. Then teaching skills, and I emphasize here um, uh, literacy skills going into the future, information literacy and data literacy skills. Then uh, repurposing of uh, library positions we are all aware that um, there are areas that are fast becoming def defunct in our libraries, like uh, print journal sections, uh, loan services. So they look those uh, areas and repurpose uh, positions so that they also do not become redundant. 
constituting teams to lead change and also to look into quality management issues. Then this is the third aspect that I looked at in terms of uh, the future, that is our collections. And here I said print versus electronic resources. And we want to say who is who. Will we remain with a lot of print collections or we are shifting towards electronic resources? And in most cases, it's not our choice. Uh, this is also partly driven by the publishing um, uh, landscape. If more and more of the resources are being published online, then we need to follow that trend and acquire and organize more and more of the electronic resources. Um, I'm, I'm sure we are all aware that um, in the developed world, uh, UK, America, they have since developed an e-first policy in response to the shifting publishing landscape. Then the issue of collaboration and partnerships, uh, as well as benchmarking, I think they would also hold key uh, going into the future. We need to strengthen um, our library faculty collaboration. Uh, we also need to undertake web visits to other institution, institutions, and we need to forge synergies and alliances so that we can better serve our constituencies. Um, adoption of a user-centric approach as opposed to us waiting for users to come to our libraries. We need to have those outreach programs where we are taking library programs uh, to the users. Otherwise, they will never come to us. And we need to embed our library work into the core business of the institution. Then in terms of um, uh, ongoing challenges, just before I conclude, and uh, also opportunities, I looked at challenges as well as opportunities, as you can see. Uh, so the challenge in most cases for us to embrace new developments uh, is related to staff skills. Uh, we also have a, a challenge of staff mobility. The moment you train, and your staff are skilled enough, uh, at some point they are absorbed elsewhere for senior positions and they leave the system. So you find out that you are always um, uh, training staff uh, for the new areas of work. Um, then the issue of uh, budgets, this is really a, a perennial problem in most libraries. Then of course, inadequate IT equipment systems and space and the issue of culture, inequality uh, emanating from the past, and of course, the aspect of uh, the current pandemic by way of COVID-19. Then I also looked at opportunities. Um, the current environment has uh, presented us with an opportunity uh, to improve our qualifications. We are witnessing a lot of our librarians enrolling for senior degrees, uh, Prof. Ina indicated that we would want our graduates to have. It excites us really to see our librarians enrolling for higher degrees so that they can uh, do research in order to be able to support uh, open science, which is a growing field in academic libraries. Um, then we also witnessing some level of uh, job satisfaction uh, emanating from these new areas that, that, that we are embracing, uh, such areas as open science, open access. We have recently witnessed also growth in transformative agreements. Um, although this is not, not really the ideal, but uh, it's a step in the right direction uh, so that our users can have unlimited access uh, to um, uh, resources. Then we have also witnessed uh, as an opportunity growth in digitization, collaboration with IT, academic development centers, um, artificial intelligence, uh, robots that I spoke to earlier. Then um, there's also an opportunity for librarians to be creative 
to be flexible and also to be innovative in their approaches. This will be my last slide in terms of my final thoughts. The library of the future is a place where people, not books, not even information, are at the center. People desire spaces where they can gather, where they can learn, where they can live and play. The library of the future is equipped to empower people toward uh, knowledge. In order for us to continue to succeed as librarians, we will need to get rid of orthodoxies and embrace innovation. Physical libraries remain in place, and so will be the books, but what will change is their size, shape, and form. The future of academic librarians, in my view, is therefore guaranteed and adapting and meeting the changing needs of users in the fourth industrial revolution is all that will be required in order for librarians and libraries to stay relevant. Thank you so much, Program Director. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. Um, Thank you for so much for reminding us where we come from. You reminded me when I was 19 uh, and I was studying at the University of Transkei, and that was the first time that I saw a library oh, and there was a, there was a cut catalog. And uh, over the years, higher education has transformed into adopting the 4IR as you have explained. I particularly like the fact that the challenges that you have in higher education are the challenges that everybody has in all library sectors, the staff skills, the staff mobility, and especially the budget. But I also noticed uh, and noted that in your presentation, you talked about how we can use some of our spaces um, for the purpose and to deliver a better um, service to our patrons. You also talked about collaboration and partnership, and it's something that we as LIASA members, we need to, to, to talk about it more. How can we collaborate from one sector to the other sector in order for us to make sure that we keep at par with the global environment? Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo, for your presentation. It was a wonderful one. Um, we're going to move now to um, a, an item. Um, apologies, colleagues, in, in advance. I am, um, I, I don't, I'm not a Sutu speaker, but I'm going to try. Uh, Zandi Lenyati is going to give us a poem on Riketeka de Library Labadi Ribatona. Hope I've done justice. Over to you, Zandile. Thank you, Linda. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I'm going to read a poem that I have written. I hope that you will understand what is written. I'm not a poet, but I have tried. The theme of the poem is Rikitika di Library, Libadi Ribaton. And it goes like this. Timelang me pedi a kito le chedi mutei. Timelang badi malinyora la kito le chedi mutei. Timelang barula hani ba kito le chedi mutei. Timelang bato sali kito mo tichabe. Kalu ona ba kolo le ba na ba kolo mutalo hani no. Kalu ona di chaba di kito matika tahang abuti. Kalu ona di chaba di soka fata matilo aton. Kalona ha hona budi mo mapilong abat. So lela ko toka fata matilo amatuti tuti dinaga baruta bana baoti mapodisi ba diredi loako ba bueledi matole leba isiana pe uba ngu ba badi. Kana sa kile ka chaba la balawe la kimsi kibole. Hala hala di kaka pata kito le kito le to hala hala. Hala hala bati malenyora la kito le chedi mse to hala hala. Hala hala barula kani ba kito le chedi mse to hala hala. Hala hala bato sali kiti moto chabeng hala hala. Kalu unaro kwa na kubuisa. 
ka lona re khona go taka ka lona re bona kholo mo moweng ka lona ga re tsana bodu ka lona re khona go bona ditiro ka lona re ntshali ba mo malapeng ka lona re itse le fatshi lothe le tsotlhe pedi mo go lona hala hala di library hala 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 ba dire ba di library hala hala thank you Thank you so much, Zandile. Uh, the only thing that I, I, I heard was halala to libraries, halala to the workers of, of LIS profession. And thank you so much for your wonderful poem. And I have, hope everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to our next speaker uh, on, on the program. Um, who's gonna let us know about the future of librarianship from a special library perspective. Ms. Teresa DeYoung is managing a special library in information services at South African Astronomical Observatory since 2015. She has an MPhil at the University of Cape Town and her research is based on history and development of astronomical libraries alongside that of astronomical research. Teresa has a wide range of experience from across all subsectors, from uh, a public librarian, school, li school, school librarian, and now a special librarian. She has served as a, a member of the National Council for Library and Information Services, and is an active member of LIASA, as well as Library and Information Services in astron Astronomy which is Lisa. She has received numerous accolades, including the pres prestigious Liasa Librarian of the Year Award. Thank you. Over to you, Teresa. Um, thanks so much, Linda. Um, I'm actually very thankful that I... Can you see my screen, first of all? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. I'm actually very thankful that I've been scheduled to speak further down this morning um, because I now have the opportunity to say that a special library includes libraries that are not part of academic higher education necessarily, or public libraries, or as we haven't heard yet, school libraries, and that there are many special libraries. Libraries consisting of specialized collections date back to around 650 BC to the clay library of the Babylonian king, Ashurbanipal, sorry, uh, which is the oldest surviving royal library collection. It was only around 1905 that the term special library came into being in the United States. Special libraries, oh, let me just move on. Special libraries include an array of different libraries from a variety of different organizations. Some examples of special libraries are corporate, law, medical, physics, military, music, transportation, museums, media, performing arts, theolog theological, government departments and agencies, research institutes, historical societies, NPOs, and even fashion libraries, to name a few. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge all my special library colleagues who are attending the session. And I would like um, to say that I hope that as I speak, you feel that I am indeed speaking on your behalf, considering our outstanding diversity. Because special libraries range from small one librarian library to huge organizations and corporate libraries with a number of librarians. I've just put a few examples of South African special libraries up here. My apologies if your library is not there. Um, there is really not enough space on the slide. So special libraries across the library sector, sector encapsulates the following specific traits. We all have highly specialized collections and information for a special group of clientele with specific requirements. 
We all have librarians who are technologically savvy and proactively gather, analyze and disseminate specialized information. We provide an on-demand customized information service that add value to our organizations. And we have been doing this for many years. And now with the 25th anniversary of LIASA, it is indeed fitting and a good time for imagining the future. Special librarianship developed out of the need to provide tools for accomplishing organizations, missions, goals, visions, and to improve productivity. In the future, special libraries need to focus more than ever on supporting the vision and mission and values of their parent organization in order to remain relevant and rapid in the rapidly changing work environment that is affected by social, economic, and political landscapes. As special librarians, we have done a sterling job in the past, but it is clear that we need to up our game to reflect the organizational objectives extremely well if we want to continue to be relevant. We must strive to be seen clearly as part of the organization's knowledge nexus, as put by Geis and Claire from the Special Libraries Association back in 2007. We need to be seen as the nexus or the connection between the organization's mission and success in achieving its objectives. This is done by converging information management, knowledge management, and planning. This means flexible, we have to be flexible enough to boldly take on new roles, if necessary, in order to show our relevance to our parent organization. Our users have very specific needs. We provide a bespoke service to these users. And the only way that we can improve this in the future is to get to know our users even more, even better than we do now. It means building very deep relationships with our users. With the information overload on all platforms, users are requesting more and more information that is specifically structured to meeting their, challenge, their changing needs. We need to continue to provide them with the most relevant customized user services in the future. In this way, our value will be more tangible to the user. In the future, libraries and librarians will be under pressure to show the value of libraries, specifically the economic value. As special librarians, we need to show this through our competencies by finding opportunities to work closely with other teams and units within our organization, by showing how we save users time in getting information, and in this way, saving hours, work hours, which can be converted into monetary value. We need to show how the user is gaining valuable information at their fingertips on time. We need to engage with open access and open science collaborations to showcase our value. And we need to network and share resources within our library sector in order to show our value. The future of special librarianship leans largely on collaboration. Collaboration within LIASA, across South Africa, across Africa, the global South and globally. Special libraries belong to a different to different special library organizations and associations, both nationally and internationally, that provide support and opportunities to learn based on operational best practice. However, there is also a need for special libraries to get to be and remain connected through LIASA in the future. One main reason, but not the only one, is so that we can, can become recognized as professional librarians and in so doing improve our reputation within our parent organizations. Networking and collaboration is and will be more important if we want to continue to be a moving force within special librarianship in the future. Information on the latest resources need to be available. New insights into services that can be offered need to be looked into and best practices should be duplicated. And by means of understanding the latest trends in the organizational field that we serve, as well as in the library and information 
field, science field, library and information service field, we will be able to succeed in providing a good service. Technology is a powerful tool. The special library of the future needs to ensure that its digital services evolves alongside an increasingly technological workplace and user. We cannot afford to lag behind. The last decade or so has seen services such as the provision of digital resources. But moreover, users are expecting more from the special library, especially at its first point of contact, library websites and apps. In the future, libraries need to develop and adapt to newer technology, technologies in order to keep users up to date. Digital services offered by the future library need to be of cutting edge quality. These digital services range from digital library content and design to data curation metadata, managing license agreements, creation and, and, and artificial intelligence systems. Many special libraries work, special librarians work in environments where the parent organization generates big data. Special librarians in the future, especially in South Africa, need to leverage this opportunity more than it has been um, for us to show our relevance in terms of data librarianship and the management of big data. Technological advances have the potential of creating skills and showing glaring gaps in our skills as special librarians if we as librarians do not stay on top of it by upskilling ourselves. Upskilling can only happen if librarians are aware of future trends. We need to ensure that we are data savvy if we want to deliver a relevant service in the future. Information is a valuable commodity in our special library environment. We cannot provide this commodity in a fourth industrial revolution era if we do not have the skills. These skills include personal competencies, such as sharing organizational values and being proactive, as well as professional skills, such as knowledge of the organization's field of expertise. We are special because we serve only staff and members of our parent organization. And this makes it very possible for us to market effectively. Special librarianship in the future demands a high level of visibility. We also need to be excellent in communicating our competencies in creative ways, such as inviting ourselves to key meetings in order to understand how the library can help various groups within our parents' organization, as well as to remind them of what the library has to offer. Visibility serves as a reminder to the organization's management of the value we bring to the organization. So go ahead and show off your services and entice your users with what you have to offer. In summary, the future of librarianship from my perspective as a special librarian is shaped by our alignment to our parent organization's mission, our bespoke user services, our proving of our tangible economic value, our collaboration and networking efforts, our ability to keep digital services using, to keep up digital services using technology, the upskilling of our competencies and vigorous marketing abilities. There are a number of items that I have not mentioned in detail due to time constraints, such as makerspaces, research data management, digitization, data curation metrics, and impact factors. But I've tried to be as relevant and to speak from an overall um, special library perspective, taking in consideration the, the various size libraries that um, form part of our sector. We need to be relevant, we need to be bold, and we need to be techno savvy and knowledgeable of new developments. And we need to be hashtag be visible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for a wonderful, informative um, presentation.
What I've taken from your presentation is the fact that um, all the sectors, they are the same. They deal with the same things, the digital services, data curation, data management, collaboration is very important. It's something that we need to think about so that we don't work in silos. You talked about the flexibilities of us, us as staff members in order for us to make sure that we render a service that is um, that 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 is contains a lot of future trends. And mostly you talked about upskilling. But how do you upskill yourself if you don't know? So you said we need to be aware of future trends in order for us to upskill. As everybody here who has a Liasa t-shirt and who's got their t-shirt, it says hashtag be visible to everybody. Thank you so much, Teresa, for a wonderful <laughs> for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I do hope that everybody has taken a piece of what has been discussed today. Thank you, Teresa. Colleagues, we're gonna move on now to a future perspective of South, Afri of South African librarianship from a school library perspective. So Ms. Janine Leroux will be giving us a presentation. Uh, Ms. Janine is a Deputy Chief Education Specialist with the Gauteng Department of Education in Library Services Subdirectorate. She has a master's degree in education, leadership and management, a bachelor of education honors degree in curriculum studies, a higher diploma in education and a national certificate in public administration. So part of her job is to implement the national guidelines for school, library and information services, providing training development to district library coordinators, supporting district and establish school libraries with all modes and supporting teachers to develop learners reading skills and promote reading. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Janine. Over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair. Uh, this is really not our platform that we usually use. So um, if you could please give me an indication that you can see my screen and that you can hear me. Um, it is unfamiliar to raise. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you so yes, much. Thank you so we much. Can. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning to everyone. And um, thank you to Liasa for um, inviting the Kauti Department of Education to do a presentation this morning. Um, with regard to uh, the future of librarianship in South Africa from a school perspective. So um, we highly appreciate uh, the invitation. Thanks so much. Um, I'd just like to say that um, all the presenters ahead of me uh, were so very informative. Um, Teresa, just your, your presentation recently was such a big eye opener. Thank you for that, Dr. Moyo as well, and um, Prof. Ree. Um, I really gained quite a bit from your presentations. Um, moving forward, um, um, in Gauteng, we have uh, 15 educational districts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly what um, Prof. Uh, Fouri did, where she said, um, we don't know what the future holds, but all we can do is provide um, perhaps a retrospective um, and a current look at what um, is happening at the moment. And it could give us a glimpse into um, what the future might hold for um, school libraries. So. I'm going to also, as Dr. Moyo said, um, just, just give you a context of where we find ourselves um, at the moment. So in Gauteng, um, 15 educational districts, we're looking at approximately 2,600 schools roughly, and uh, library services in the Gauteng Department of Education. Uh, we have a provincial office, um, and then we also have 15 district offices, and we essentially exist to provide support for curriculum delivery in schools, and that is why we are um, why we are around. Um, what is our core services as a subdirectorate before under the library services and LTSM, a learner teacher support material directorate, and we are a subdirectorate within that directorate. And our core business is basically establishing new school libraries, uh, especially with sponsors and partners and NGOs and other directorates. Um, we also in the business of revitalizing libraries that have fallen into a state of decay or not being used anymore, and also supporting functional school libraries to maintain their functionality. So that's what we do. Other than um, you know revitalizing libraries and re-establishing them, and we're looking at all models as well. 
We also promote reading, actively promote reading and support the usage of the digital e-lending library, which is managed by Overdrive, um, establish a monitoring reading clubs. Um, so we train our districts to, uh, to train teachers on how to establish and sustain reading clubs. Part of our service is also um, to uh, bring a little bit of fun into, into reading and show learners that reading is so, uh, can be so much fun. And we have what we call a Pendulani literacy quiz where learners read books of about 11 titles and they come to um, gather and, and, and we have this big playoff and it, and it culminates into a provincial playoff and there is a winning uh, school who holds the trophy for uh, that year. Also, besides, we um, organize and participate and we encourage schools to commemorate and celebrate um, lit library and literacy days, like World Reader Library Day, Literacy Month, Library Month, and so forth. So we really um, want schools to be excited about reading, um, you know, and, and besides that, we also encourage um, our district library facilitators to um, train schools and teachers on information skills, those very, very important information skills that uh, Prof. Marie spoke about earlier on. We try to instill it um, um, from primary school, but we are faced with so many challenges as a South Directorate, um, and this is also just giving you a context and showing you where um, we would like to see um, our future, um, you know, our path uh, moving towards. So um, we find, our, find ourselves having less than twenty percent of public school libraries being fully functional. That mean, that does not mean that um, there aren't other categories. Um, we have quite a few categories: fully functional, um, partially functional, non-functional, no libraries at all. Uh, and we just find that twenty percent of our schools have fully functional libraries. And what is a fully functional library? It's a central library at a school that has um, human resource managing the library. There are uh, learners are being issued books. Um, there's an issue system in place. Um, the connection is being built year on year and um you know it's just a thriving library and that's what we call a fully functional library and there are many reasons that our other libraries the other 80 percent um, or more than 80 percent falls into the partially non-functional and no libraries at all and these are the challenges that we face on a daily basis and this is really really on the ground um what our district officials face every single day um going into schools and there's a lack of space for libraries, for libraries to be developed, you know, a uh, lack of resources, lack of funding, but most importantly, a lack of dedicated library personnel to manage the school library and the reading um, activities and that's reading for um, enjoyment activities that you're talking about, like the reading um, for learning activities. Um, so now, like I see human resources are number one challenge. Um, and also we don't have a school library policy which, which addresses the issue of school, um, school library staff. Uh, we only have guidelines, um, as, some of, as some of you will know, the National Guidelines for School Library Information Services, and where library services is needed most in our previously disadvantaged schools, like our townships, most townships are no fee paying schools. So there's no income being generated to pay for library personnel um, and keep a library um, well managed. And so we're finding that uh, most township schools are also built without a central library, and therefore we, we never really have space um, because our schools are so overcrowded. Um, and so we do look at other models of, of, um, of library services um, for, for those schools. So what are our interventions? So we know what challenges we face on a daily basis, but we also have to mitigate these challenges. And um, so some of our interventions are um, the establishment of other library models. So not just this beautiful central library that we all aspire to have, but we're also looking at library and reading corners, um, establishing sustainable networks with municipal libraries. Um, we had just had a presentation from City of Joburg, so we really appreciate um, their input when it comes to involving and roping our schools into uh, the many, many activities. We are very, very grateful for that. Um, and we want schools to develop those networks and get block loans from schools. Um, we also identify schools we, we encourage schools to identify and engage possible sponsors, um, especially in the areas in which um, they, they find themselves. So there's always businesses who are willing and wanting to um, sponsor libraries or, or some form of or model of library. And we also encourage schools to procure trolley libraries where there is no space and schools do get um, 
they allow 10% of the LTSM budget. So we encourage them to purchase uh, library trolleys and so on. And we also encourage schools to access zero rated reading sites. And um, we also encourage the optimal usage of the GE mobile library services. We have a few mobile library buses which go out to um, the more um, rural areas um, in the Gauteng province. Um, so those are really on the outskirts and they are doing an amazing uh, job there. Um, and then we also encourage the usage of the digital library. And that's where we're seeing um, a future, a future, possible future for um, um, the, uh, the, the school library where um, transformation will be taking place is the digital library. And I will expand a little bit more on that. Okay, so there we go, just an overview. We went together opting and advocating for classroom libraries, trolley libraries, mobile library services, reading clubs, and partnerships with community libraries, just in a nutshell. Um, and now I want to just take a retrospective gaze uh, to some time in history, but not too long ago. Um, and the not too long ago was just um, a mere two years ago when we were all locked down and um, school came to a halt. And I hope that. Um, what I'm going to share will give us an idea of um, where the future lies um, with regard to school libraries. And so the retrospective case just takes us two years back to a time that was very difficult for all of us. And um, as Dwyer said in 2020, as a result of COVID-19, we all entered a twilight zone where so many of our knowns became unknowns. It was really a time of great uncertainty, and especially for us in library services, school library services, we just didn't know what to do. Um, and, if, and, and we saw um, that engaging in reading became one of the modes in which people committed socially during that uh, very hard lockdown. And uh, we, were, we are, as a province, privileged enough to have the digital e-lending library. Um, and, and we saw all, all across social media um, that these became uh, freely available and accessible um, to, to people across the globe. Um, and just from the literature, we, we could see that um, in an effort to fill the void created by social distancing, reading books, sharing thoughts through uh, virtual book clubs, uh, people kept company, they built a new world through reading and most found comfort in reading either through digital or conventional ways. So it was a very good way for us um, during the lockdown to, to capitalize on, on reading while learners and parents were at home. However, we also knew the reality of what was on the ground. We knew that, um, as Dwyer says, and draws attention to the quality of opportunity to access digital platforms. So we were very mindful of that, that there was going to, while learners were home, there were social justice issues, all right? Equity and access to, to technological tools such as data and Wi-Fi. And ultimately, we were left with questions like, um, who, who does have access? Um, who doesn't have access? And why? So we were quite mindful for, of that. And I think that also um, plays a major role in the future of school libraries. If you want this digital transformation, there are all these um, social justice issues of equality and access and equity um, that, that needs to be um, addressed and, and, and um, quite robustly as well. Um, so during lockdown, what did we do? What did we see? This, I hope, will give us a glimpse into the future. We had district library activities that were grounded, and then um, we fell back onto the digital platform. The GE Digital Healing um, Library became a key reading promotion focus. It's still um, running. The digital library is administered by Overdrive, which I think everybody's familiar with. And we also saw during this time, while we were promoting it and kids were just at home, but we saw an upsurge in the usage of, um, of the platform. So we receive uh, weekly updates. So this is just me zoning into uh, the very hard lockdown. So we, um, I mean, we think these stats from as early as last week or today, you know, how able to go into the back end of overdrive. But just to give you a glimpse into what happened um from the hard lockdown uh january to march you know we were, we were just getting into um the lockdown and then during a very hard lockdown if you look at april to june uh those checkouts almost doubled um so kids and parents and teachers were really getting onto um, the digital e-lending library um and accessing it and uh, it became uh, quite popular 
um, and hopefully that's where we will be moving in the future. All right, and then also currently, um, so we see that uh, almost two, two links. So the digital library um, really shows us that the direction that we're moving into, into the digital transformation, like the city of Joe books talk about as well. And then also we are seeing um, on the other side, um, the human resource is still very, very important. And at the moment we have the uh, PYEI um, program. It's a presidential youth employment initiative and it's been running since um, the end of 2020. To, we're gonna see it running through to 2023. Currently we are in phase three. So we've been through phase one, phase two. They were almost like the teething, initial teething stages. So um, I think now in phase three, we're able to get um, we, 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 um, more educated in terms of how uh, the, the, the program should run. So we have reading champions in schools. Um, these are unemployed youth uh, with a matric certificate. And for library services, we are managing the reading champion component. There are other components to it as well. But what we're seeing is that these reading champions come into schools and we train them. Um, they are there to promote reading. They are reading chapters to ensure that there are reading sessions taking place at schools, that the drop all and read is being observed in schools. They are um, setting up, establishing and sustaining reading clubs. They are encouraging schools and also being a public, playing a pivotal role in the celebration of library and literacy events and so on. And we see that quite a few of them are becoming so enthusiastic about the library and we're starting to see some libraries turning around and there is some library revitalization or establishment. So we can definitely say um, that when it comes to the future, we are seeing, um, and, and we take a look, and we look at it retrospectively, that uh, there is digital transformation, it is taking off, but also we still require and we yearn for a future where there is a warm body um, in school library. So we don't know what the future holds, but that's what we're yearning for. Um, that the digital um, library will really take off in leaps and bounds and that um, in the future we will have, um, you know, human resource to manage our libraries, to impart um, a love for reading and learners and also most importantly, uh, the information skills, our uh, lifelong skills that um, learners want to use. So what is the future? And we left with so many questions um, and that's where I'm going to end my presentation. Just to say to you that we as an education department, I left the uh, library service educate, um, a sub director in the Department of Education. We left with questions like um, How do we sustain an interest in information skills in reading and the library? And I said, All models of the library. All right. Um, what is the role of the teacher librarian where there are teacher librarians? Um, what, what, what is our what uh, future do we have um, in the absence of the teacher librarian or the library assistants or um, the reading champions and who do we empower and how do we empower? So these are questions uh, that are fertile ground for a um, longitudinal study. Um, and we can see that um, ho hopefully if our voices are heard and um, you know we, we do some robust research based on, on where we are at the moment, um, it will possibly force um, the powers that be to provide us with that human resource and to ensure that the gap is, is closed um, between the hands and the hand knots and that you can um, fully roll out um, digital libraries and, and access to digital libraries to, to all schools. Um, and those are the questions that we left with and um, that would be the end of my presentation, uh, Chair. Um, thank you so very much. Thank you, Janine. Um, thank you for giving us the glimpse of something that is working in school libraries. Um, I think you're doing great uh, as compared to, to, to libraries in South Africa, to school libraries in South Africa. Like I said before, I think there's a need for us to use our academy to make sure that we share these resources, a collaboration, um, there is a need for basics. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening at higher education, um, at school libraries, um, at, at anywhere. But um, if we collaborate, we will reach to a better South African library school.
libraries. Uh, colleagues, uh, we're running out of time. Thank you, Ms. Jenin. Um, I am now going to ask um, Anumari to play us a message of support from the DDG um, of the Department of Arts and Culture, Mr. Vosindima. Mr. Nazim Hadi, President elect, Mr. Charlie Molepo, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to deliver the message of support on behalf of the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture on this important day for librarians in the country. Librarians Day and Liasa birthday month coincide with the birth of our first democratic president, Nelson Holly Shasha Mandela. This month is memorable to South Africans and the world at large. July 10th is a special day in the profession. During this day, librarians in the country are celebrating their achievements, hard work and professionalism in providing services to the public. The past two years were not easy for everyone due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, librarians remained hopeful and prove themselves to be innovative and ensure that services are provided efficiently and effectively. The collective effort of the sector to provide reliable, relevant and up-to-date information and dedication to the profession was critical during the pandemic. We have seen several initiatives where online services were offered to the public as a result of the COVID restrictions. The communities, more especially the youth, always require up-to-date library material and free public internet access to apply for jobs and access study material. Librarians are central to the numerous programs aimed at increasing literacy in the country. These programs facilitated with schools, old age homes and correctional centers educate and instill a culture of reading amongst children, youth and the aged. Our government has prioritized the importance of access to information as enshrined in our constitution and continues make, to make funding available to enhance the provision of the service. The implementation of the Community Library Conditional Grant is heavily dependent on the services provided by the library personnel. Therefore, the department continues to capacitate all the professionals working in our libraries by providing bursaries and other training opportunities through the Community Library Conditional Grant to study towards a library and information services qualification. The ongoing challenges and opportunities of the legislative framework affecting the sector is noted with concern. The complexities of the Copyright Amendment Bill delayed its finalization. The department acknowledges the unfortunate tension around the competing interest on the right to property and the rights to provide access to information in an attempt to promote the social economic development of our citizens. The absence of norms and standards in the sector is a challenge and the country's financial situation is exacerbating the situation. However, through the Community Library Conditional Grant, the department will continue to provide short and medium term strategies to enhance services to the public. Since the inception of the grant, a total of 238 new libraries have been built and 670 existing libraries have been upgraded and maintained. There are more than 2,400 library staff employed through the grant. This is inclusive, inclusive of qualified librarians, library assistants, library cadets, and general staff who render their services selflessly. The department is currently investigating a mechanism of appointing these staff permanently. To date, there are 220 services for the visually impaired countrywide. State-of-the-art technologies are provided to render services to the blind. Our libraries are becoming more and more inclusive in their approach. In the current financial year, an amount of 1.5 billion rand has been made available towards the transformation of the library information services. The department aims to build 29 new libraries and upgrade and maintain 40 existing facilities. These facilities are depending on librarians to function optimally. 
Therefore, I'm encouraging each and every librarian today to continue maintaining high standards and to remain abreast of new developments. The department is acknowledging the commitment, hard work, and dedication of libraries and all the practitioners in the profession. The librarians always service the communities with dignity and patience. Without you, it would have been difficult to execute our mandate. On behalf of the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture, I would like to wish all the librarians a happy day and to Liasa, happy birthday and many more years to come. I thank you. Thank you so much um, um, to the DDG. Uh, we're running out of time and I'm hoping that everybody is going to stay because a lot has, is, is coming. Um, I, I don't think we will go over half past 12. Uh, so I am pleading with everybody to, to stay. Our next speaker is Professor Peter Law and uh, I do think everybody knows him. He holds a D full degree, which he got in 1991 as well as an honorary doctorate from the University of Pretoria. He was the first South African national librarian from 2000 to 2003 and served as a secretary general of IFRA IFLA, during 2005 to 2008. In his retirement, he continues to pursue scholarly interest as a research associate in the Department of Information Science University of Pretoria. He has convened uh, a lot of committees, but amongst them, it was the information, the formation of Library and Information Association of South Africa, LIASA. He is one of the major founders of our association and is a proud member of member number one on the LIASA membership list. Liasa has awarded him an honorary membership at its 10th anniversary in 2007. Over to you, Professor Pitalo. Good morning, or rather good afternoon. Every, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Program director, colleagues and friends, thank you for inviting me to participate in this celebration. It's a real privilege for me to look back on the last 25 years and to share some key milestones with you. Not all, obviously, but especially a selection from my personal recollections and perspective. Certainly to celebrate together. I'm better qualified to speak about the birth and the baby steps of Liasa. I was very deeply involved at that stage, but then later my energy got absorbed by the creation of the National Library and by international commitments and so forth. And I retired in 1921. I live in the Southern Cape, quite far from the nearest Liasa branch activities. So I'm a somewhat distant, but nevertheless, I'm an engaged observer of Liasa and a proud founder member. Can I have the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, I just mentioned here some early milestones, things that happened before the actual birth of Liasa. And these are discussed in the Global Gleanings column in the June 2022 issue of Liasa in Touch. I'm not going to go into details here. There I mentioned the NEPI report, Lisdesa, ULIS, and ULIS II. I'm going to skip those now and mention only our immediate beginnings. I got involved in this process actually by accident. Uh, at the ULIS conference, uh, we broke into groups and uh, we had to do feedback. In those days, we still used overhead uh, projectors. And I was appointed as the rapporteur for our group. And I enlivened my presentation by making small drawings. Now this unintentionally gave me a very high profile in the meeting. I ended up being appointed as the chair of the interim executive committee that was appointed to get a National Library Association, a unified National Library Association off the ground. Um, the next slide, please. 
Um, it was, we were given one year in which to uh, organize the constituent or founding conference for LIASA. It was a tall order, but we succeeded. And here you see a picture of the team, all of us looking a lot younger than we look today. Um, so our first, our first our constituent conference was held on the 10th of July, 19, well, on 8th to the 10th of July, 1997, with over 450 participants. And these included Bob Wedgworth, then the president of the American Library Association, Leo Fort, who was the secretary general of IFLA, and Ross Shimon, who was then the chief executive of SILIP, the British Library and Information Association, he, who subsequently became sub secretary general of IFLA too. And then of course, not to forget our mentor and godmother, Kay Rosaroka, who was there on hand to really help guide the process. We proposed a draft constitution. It was debated at length and it was adopted and we chose the name Library and Information Association of South Africa, LIASA. And it was said that and thought that this sounded like a Muni word for dawning, LIASA, dawning or beginning. A transitional elect executive committee was elected. Uh, and that is the one you're seeing here, I think, yes. Um, uh, and our tasks were to recruit members, um, to negotiate with the existing library associations, and that wasn't easy. Unfortunately, Lee will pulled out of the process. Uh, to lobby government, because libraries were really in a very poor state. To hold elections for office bearers and to organize LIASA's first annual conference. It was a lot to do. And as the chair of this uh, committee, I actually toured the country and went to all sorts of places where there had never been a library association meeting before to lobby for this, to make the profession aware of what was happening and to encourage them to join up. Uh, if you can move on to slide five, please. So our first, our, sec, our next master, master number two that I want to mention here was the first annual conference, which took place then in 1998. Salus and Liasa and Alasa had agreed to this ban. We did not merge them. Our task was to unify the profession, uh, uh, was to unify the profession and not to unify the library association. There, there were strategic reasons why we did not actually merge them. We organized elections for the president, the executive, and we also organized for the branches to hold their elections. And I was able with great pride and um, satisfaction and relief on behalf of the uh, Transitional Executive Committee to hand over LIASA as a going concern to Ellen Tass, who was elected as our first president. I subsequently served on the executive of LIASA and also as chair of the Gauteng North branch, but then I became less, less involved as I say. And the early history of the up to this point is covered in my uh, column, Global Gleanings for June 2022. The following period that follows will be also covered in Global Gleanings in September this year. Now for some of the more recent or post-creation, post-founding uh, milestones. First of these I'd like to mention is the founding of the launch of LIASA in Dutch in around 2000. I'm not exactly sure whether it was 2000 or before that, because I know there was a predecessor. There was an earlier black and white newsletter which preceded LIASA in Dutch. But I think it was in the year 2000 that LIASA in Dutch actually emerged roughly in its present form as a regular uh, newsletter occur appearing every quarter. It was, and it remains professionally well edited and well laid out. It's attractive, it's well illustrated. And I think it's a great achievement that we've been able to, LIASA has been able to produce this regular newsletter for its members. And I think our long serving editor, Maura Murat, deserves some, uh, certainly deserves kudos for this. <clears throat> 
The next one I'd like to mention is the launch of the South African Library Week, which was in 2001. Um, we've celebrated SA Library Week every year since then, and it's done with eye-catching posters and events that capture the attention of the public, and they raise uh, a lot of attention uh, they raise the profile of the profession of what we do among the public at large that which i think is terribly important i'd also like to mention here then the south african librarians day which was initiated in 2014 and with that is actually what we are celebrating today i move on to milestone number five and that is the ifra world library and information congress which was held in Durban in 2007. That was that coincided with Liasa's 10th anniversary. Um, and in Durban, uh, we organized the World Library and Information Conference. We successfully hosted a major international conference of several thousand participants. And this, I think, is proof that Liasa had come of age. It was personally gratifying for me as at, then, at that stage, the Secretary General of IFLA, that South Africa hosted this conference so successfully. I may hasten to add that uh, Durban was not chosen because I was the Secretary General. It was actually chosen before I assumed duty at IFLA. But certainly our conference uh, illustrated our growing international stature, and this was also uh, marked by the election of Ellen Tass as the IFLA president-elect, and she served with great distinction as IFLA's president in the term 2009 to 2011. So Liasa was certainly making its mark internationally. I'm on milestone number six. Can I have the following slide, please? Was the, was the, I think milestone number six, for, for milestone number six, I would choose Liasa's official recognition as a professional body in the year 2014. That's that in that December of that year, the South African Qualifications Authority or SACWA approved the uh, registra recognition of Liasa as a professional body. And it approved the registration of the professional designation, professional librarian. This was in terms of the National Qualifications Framework Act. And it empowers LIASA to set the standards for professional practice, to accredit qualifications, to award the designation of professional librarian, to maintain a register of these people, and to oversee their continuing professional development, CPD. And this is important because it elevates the status of LIASA and professional librarians. And it also, and this is really important, it ensures, it seeks to ensure that the people of South Africa are served, expertly served by properly highly trained professionals. I move on then to milestone number seven. And that was the IFLA World Library and Information Congress in Cape Town in 2015. And in contrast with the 2007 WLIC, this was almost a routine affair. By now, LIASA was a well-established association and simply took the WLIC in its stride. If there were any hiccups, I wasn't aware of them. And that is, of course, the way it goes with international conferences. There are always hiccups, but the main thing is that the, that the participants, the delegates, shouldn't notice them. And I think in that respect, this, this too was a very successful conference. The fact that South Africa was twice selected in such a short period to host IFLA's WLIC is certainly an, ach an achievement of note. And then I want to add one more, um, uh, one more uh, milestone, which we might not think is a milestone, but in fact, today's celebration of IFLA's first 25 years, I think she is also, should also be recognized as a very important milestone. We can celebrate the fact that we've created a generally well-functioning, well-run organization with continuity of leadership, with a smooth routine handover of executive positions. Maybe we have had some ups and downs, 
but not any that are seriously destabilizing. It is a tribute to the association that we all take Liasa smooth operation for granted. Now, this is not happening in all countries, I can assure you. We have a properly staffed and competent national office, which ensures our continuity and stability. That in itself is an achievement. And I think the kudos here to Anna-Marie Gorsen, who's been our manager since 2009. I'd like to conclude by saying that, uh, by admitting that I've certainly not been able to deal with all our milestones. Um, but if we look at the celebratory 2002, June 2002 issue of Libraries, Lab Liasa in Touch, you will see, I'm, I'm sure that you've already seen it, that it reflects a really vibrant association with an impressive panoply of branches and interest groups, an impressive range of activities in which, and this is something I really appreciate, in, appreciate activities in which local libraries and communities are involved including courses, the promotion of books and reading, story hours, and celebrations of important events such as Human Rights Day, at which I think we're pretty good. The quality of today's presentations, the ones that we've heard so far, really give me confidence These are the, of, in the future of our profession. Uh, these, our presentations have been professional and insightful, and I think that this also reflects the fact that we've expanded our influence and raised awareness of LIS in government and many communities. In this way, I think that LIASA helps to empower us as librarians and information workers to contribute to the development of a fair and equitable, peaceful and prosperous South Africa. Next slide, please. I uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Faru, for taking us through the humble beginnings of the journey of Liasa and how far we have become and where we're going. We thank you so much for those few who gathered together and saw the need for us to unify for a better association. Like Nora have said in the comments, we have an appeal for all to apply to be awarded the PLSA designation if you haven't done so and you can do that by firstly joining our membership thank you so much peter Lowe. Uh, we are gonna hear now from nazim who's going to talk about the future of the association thank you professor peter thank you very much Linda, and um, it's quite a um, it's quite a hill to climb to follow Professor Law. Um, <laughs> um, I have great um, respect for him, um, and and what he says. Um, I look forward to his global gleanings column um, with every Liasa in touch. Um, so it's quite a um, it's quite an act to follow. Um, to, to write the, the way forward um, is a daunting task um, and I, I've probably changed what I wanted to say in any case um, after this morning's presentations. I do want to say thank you very much to everybody who contributed to this program. I think it's been an amazing program um, that has been called off. I do want to say that um, we really thought very hard about this day and what we wanted to put forward. Um, and in my mind, it, it took a while um, for me to see where it was going, but I am very thankful and grateful to, to Linda and to Anna Marie and the rest of the people who work behind the scenes to make today possible um, and have actually delivered such an amazing program. To the people who did the presentations, I, I really, and, and this is not the vote of thanks people, my apologies. Um, but I do want to say to the people who have presented to, to our colleagues, to our amazing professionals, um, thank you very much for your contributions. You've um, certainly gave me a lot to think about. And so I've slightly changed what I wanted to say. Um, 
based on what I've actually seen thus far. Um, and, and forgive me if I, if I refer to my notes because I made notes as I went along. Um, I think of the things that really stood out for me um, today was, was a lot on, there was a lot said about literacies um, and specifically digital literacies. Um, I think in a country where we struggle with literacy on so many levels, um, it is becoming a probably universal issue that we all have to address as a profession. Um, whether it is with our workforce, whether it is with the people who actually come to us for assistance, um, but literacy is in all its many forms um, is becoming an imperative issue that we have to address and grapple with um, going forward. The fact um, that we, we need to upskill, we need to constantly upskill ourselves, um, that we've got to be data savvy. Um, the fact that we have to be visible, that we have to continue marketing and advocating, etc. These are not necessarily new things, but I think as time goes on, um, it, it continues to be the things that we set us. And, and I want to touch on, on Prof. Ina Fouri's comments that she made right in the beginning, which she said, I can't tell you what the future is. I can only tell you what I think um, could possibly be happening. But the one thing she did say was that what the future requires from us is mindset change. And I think what we as librarians and information professionals do um, at the base of it is, is by and large, is, is what we've always done. Um, but the manner in which we do it, the manner in which we've got to present it, the manner in which we reach out to people continues to evolve and change. And that we've got to grapple with and that we've got to constantly be at the forefront of being able to deliver on those things. The one thing that, that really stood out for me and, and what I'm probably very passionate about um, is Prof. Uri talked about reading. And not just in South Africa, but I think across the world, so much of librarianship uh, or libraries across the world tends to negate the role that we play within the reading sphere. Um, we seem to want to disown it. Um, and yet in, in the country where we find ourselves today, um, reading is a fundamental skill that so many people lack. Um, access to reading material, um, or whether it be in printed form, whether it be in electronic form, remains a, a problem for, for so many of the people in our country. And as librarians and, and as workers in libraries, we are at the forefront of being able to do that. The, the fact that our DDG spoke about um, the intention to build 29 new libraries, upgrading 40 libraries, I applaud that um, and continue to applaud that. But I do want to say that um, it's no use building libraries, it's no use upgrading libraries if we do not have the funding that actually goes with it. And for that, marketing and advocacy continues to be something that we have to be passionate about. So what does this have to do with the future? Um, everything changes as time goes on and we've got to continuously be ready to change with the times. The last three years and COVID and what it has done to us as a profession um, and, and many other spheres of life continues to have an impact on us. And as the association, we cannot be devoid of these things. As you know, we've been grappling with restructuring for like, it seems forever. Um, and we're not necessarily at the end of the road, but the road to restructuring continues to be paramount for the ASA. We do need a changed organization. We do need to change the association. The last election has shown us this and, and in this presidency of mine, it continues to be something that bugs us about how we do not fully function the way we should. I think there are passionate people 
working within the layout structures, but the structure itself doesn't work for us to actually engage um, that for us. And so restructuring remains the, one of the paramount things that we've actually got to tackle um, in the road ahead. But together with this as well is the role of the academy. Of the many things that people have spoken about today, training and upskilling um, was one of the things that everybody touched on. And Liasa has an important and a major role to play in that regard. And therefore, one of the other projects that we really need to put emphasis on in moving forward is the estab well, not the establishment, but the creating a robust academy that speaks to the needs of library and information professionals in South Africa. And LIASA must deliver on this in developing programs, um, in being able to um, create a workforce that responds to the changing needs of our country. And so with those few words, I want to say that our role as Exco and as representative council will be to look at these two important factors. And so the future of LIASA will be looking at the restructuring, a change LIASA that speaks to the needs of um, our members, as well as an academy that will speak to not just our members, but to the allies professionals um, in the broader sense of the word and the needs that they have in order to meet the needs of the people that they serve. With those few words, I want to thank you. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's continued to be with us on this program um, as we reach the end of it. I hand over to Lyndon Taka, our program director. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazim. Um, because we've run out of town, I'm gonna call on um, our president-elect to for his final thoughts and closing the program thanks charlie uh, thank you colleagues um good uh, good afternoon um this has been one of the uh, most interesting uh, event that we the the quality of speakers that we had today was quite amazing Maybe I, maybe I don't have to go back because uh, Linda has been uh, doing quite a sterling job in, 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 in summarizing most of the issues raised by our speakers during this. But one of the trending uh, line uh, or, or issue that has been identified by all speakers it's, it's around technology, the integration of technology or the impact of OIR. As a profession, we have always adapted quite well to developments around, but what is emerging now from the speakers, we need to be more proactive. We need to identify uh, these trends before they happen so that we don't respond, but we pro proactively um, prepare uh the services that we offer to our users with these few words i would like to say thank you to the organizing committee linda Anamare, and the team uh, for the sterling work and to our presenters professor inafuri uh, uh miss nobu to mpendulo with your spokesperson <laughs> jeff it was good uh, hearing you jeff dr moyo uh, Ms. Teresa Diang, Ms. Janine Leroux, and, and obviously I, 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 I consider him my first president, although officially we know that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Ellen Tice was the first president of LIASA, but I always viewed uh, uh, Professor Peter Law as my, uh, uh, as my first um, president of the association. You, you know, what? what one when when he was going through those milestones, I remember when we were there at the University of Pretoria. I I I remember seeing the deputy president of the country during that time, Tabo Megi, coming to address the 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 
the, the organization. It was, you know, seeing those bodyguards running around and I, I could see that this is the most important person. And, and the message that he delivered, it was clear to us that we cannot continue as the two uh, separate library association based on race, but we have to unite behind this uh, uh, organization. And what what a relevant name, Liasa, meaning the dawn. And it has it has been a revelation to all of us. Uh, Liasa has gone from strength to strength. And 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 to those who are still doubtful, and 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 to those who are busy creating parallel structures, you are actually spitting in the grave of those great uh, um, uh, uh, forebearers like uh, Claire Walker, uh, 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 Patience, and, and, and other stalwarts of this uh, profession. Um, it, it's, it's very heartbreaking to see librarians losing interest in, 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 the, in the association that they should be serving. And as, 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 as today's celebration, uh, it should remind us where we come from and where we want to be. Because united, we stand, but divided, we fall. And lastly, we'd like to say thank you to our colleagues who, who gave us a nice poem, Ms. Kalin Abertain um, and Ms. Zandile Nyati. And one, one other important thing I've, I've heard uh, from the, all the presenters that came out quite clear was around the issue of mentorship. And, and as, as an association, I think one of the things that we should probably do as part of the academy is to identify mentors and, and, and al uh, align them with other mentees that, so that our profession, if you look at the current crop of leaders um, or senior managers in the library, they are all in the retirement age. And we did see this even in the specialties like your metadata and cataloging. We, we have seen quite where, where the, the, the elderly or the, the, the much uh, experienced uh, uh, professionals were leaving the profession, it left a vacuum. So I think this is the role that also the academy can play other than reskilling, but to identify mentors and have a mentorship program where it, it will it will pay mentors and mentees so that we we, we grow the profession in the right direction. And uh, lastly, colleagues, I would like to say thank you to every one of you. They were, I know that there were about 176 of you uh, because of time that we have overlapped. You have taken time to come and celebrate with us. I would like to say thank you very much to all of you and have a good day. Bye. I think I'm muted, Linda. Can I hear?